how film is. Well, anyway, my name is Joel. I'm going to be teaching here. I, last time I spoke to you guys was, I guess, a while ago. I spoke on the, it's probably about maybe 14, 15 months ago, I spoke on the, the process and the concept and of having your own personal soul winning ministry. And it was a lot of exhortation to go out, basically, to try to make, your, make some time and make it a priority. I spoke about that, and of course, I'm going to, this is sort of a companion to that. Let me get my notes here. Uh, today, what we're going to talk about is the principle of readiness. Just the simple concept of being ready. Well, ready for what? Well, several things. Now, if I were actually going to, if I were going to publish this, all my notes here, if I were going to actually try to publish this, I'd have to revise this and reset it and do everything with it before I would try to, you know, if I was going to sell it to try to get other churches to use this material to, we're not going to do anything like that. I'm just going to kind of go through it. So we have a couple of theme verses here this morning. So 10:30. We may not get to. A, we, I don't know if we're going to have 45 minutes worth of material or not. I'll go. The, I'll do the best I can. Um, let's say too. This is more of an open forum kind of discussion. This isn't really a lecture format. So if anybody wants to say something, I kind of hope you guys do. I don't want to monopolize the conversation here. So if anybody wants to say anything, please signify by raising your hand, and hopefully we can have sort of more of a discussion. Then, because you, know, you know, I've taught a lot of things. I'm also a pilot. I've taught a lot of people how to fly, and I found that if they're not asking questions or they're not participating, that means they're probably not learning anything. So try to participate as much as you can. I know this is Sunday. I know you guys work all week long, and you go to school all week, and you don't need someone haranguing you hear me. You just try to participate as much as you can. That's all I'm saying. A um, couple theme verses we have for the, today. I had one originally. I added another one. The first one, so get your Bibles out. And the uh, first one, first theme verse is going to be, if I can read my own handwriting here, 2 Timothy 4.2. How you doing, Anthony? 2 Timothy 4.2. We're talking about readiness, just the idea of being ready to serve the Lord. Ready, ready to do a lot of things. We're going to get into what we're supposed to be ready for. 2 Timothy 3.4.2. Anybody got it? Or anybody want to read it? Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Yeah, and of course, and if we go back to the, the preceding verse, you talk, it says, I charge therefore before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Then it went on to say, preach the word, etc. Then, of course, the, the following chap, verses, chapter, verse 3 onward, several verses down, talks about the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after the less. Shall they heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears? Usually when I've heard is any kind of teaching on this passage, it always gets, it always sort of denigrates into a discussion about how we're living in the last generation and how we're close to the end and how everything is just going bad. Everything is just so bad. But, I, but we wind up missing, the, we wind up, and I'm not saying that none of that's true, but we're, we're, we, we miss some really important teachings here. Instant means ready. The word instant here means ready. So be ready to do what you're supposed to do. Be ready to, be ready to, Go where you're supposed to go, do what you're supposed to do. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine and all these things we're supposed to do. So that's just that just simply needs to be ready. And of course, the other theme verse we have is going to be 1 Peter 3, 15. And that's really what we want to concentrate on here. We're going to concentrate on several things we're supposed to be ready for. 1 Peter 3, 15. I got it. So we're going to be skipping about a bit in some of the we're going to go to several different. Uh, passages, so just so you know. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready, there's the R word again, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So what's the reason? Okay, so here's a question for you. What is the reason of the hope that is within you? Oh, Christ. Yeah. In context, Christ. That's right. So you always got to be ready. So I think that kind of co coincides. So here's the things I, I wrote down as we need to be ready for. The first thing I said is preach the gospel. And that's what we're going to go over first, because if you get nothing else out of this, this uh, session, I want you to be a little bit better prepared to be ready to preach the gospel. We're actually going to, that's, that, we're going to go over that first. Other things I listed are suffering, uh, reproach, teach. Uh, I listed die. We'll go over that one last, because it's the simplest. Um, <laughs> Well, it's, there's several verses on it, but it's actually pretty, pretty easy. Either you're ready to die or you're not. And frankly, right now I'm not, but we'll talk about that. Hopefully we've got a little time left. But first thing we want to talk about is just being ready to preach the gospel. Uh, 
I broke my own rule Friday. Friday, I took a day off work for the first time in a long time. I was sick New Year's Eve, and I, that was, but I wasn't working that day. And I was sick Friday. I had a really bad cold. I could barely hear myself talk in the morning. Called off. Later in the day, I was feeling a little better, so I took a little walk to the beach. Late in the afternoon, I took a little walk to the beach. Well, there was this woman, this young woman there. I was walking down Commercial, East Commercial, all the way to the pier, you know? You know where that is? It's, in, it's about a mile and a half from where I live, so it's a nice little walk, you know? Trying to clear your head, make you feel a little better. So, walk over there. There's a girl. She's, she's got all her... She had a bunch of piercings and tattoos. Uh, she, uh... It's clear she'd been living on the street. She had all her belongings and some makeshift boxes and luggage, and she was trying to carry it all. And then she's asking a couple people for help, and she asked me to help her carry some stuff to a Denny's restaurant, which is over by where the church used to meet. And uh, so I said, all right. So I carried it maybe like a block or two. And here, when somebody does you a favor, when someone asks you a favor, that's a golden opportunity to preach the gospel to them. When some total stranger asks you to do a favor, that's a golden opportunity. But I, I broke my own rule, and I wasn't ready. So I walked home, after I, after I dismissed her, I walked home, then I, good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're in, right now we're in 1 Peter 3.15, we're talking about just readiness is the topic today. Thank you. Alright, where was I? Alright, so anyway, I walked back home, then I said, you know what, I just broke my own rule. I said, this isn't going to fly today, because I mean, I wasn't ready. I'm preaching on Sunday morning about being ready, I'm not preaching, I'm teaching actually teaching about being ready to preach the gospel, and I wasn't ready. So I said, yeah, well, that's not going to fly today. So I actually went, I actually ran home, went to my car, got a couple of my tracks, ran all the way back. This is like two blocks. It wasn't that far. Then I found her. She was still in the restaurant waiting. For, she was supposed to be meeting a relative there. I just I gave her a couple of dollars for, for, for food, and I gave her the tracks, and I started, I just gave her, I preached the gospel a little bit to her, maybe two minutes. It didn't, didn't talk real long. She was actually really glad. She was actually really glad somebody cared enough to do that. She was actually very touched that someone cared enough to do that. And I said to myself, okay, I said, from now on, we just got to be ready. We got to be ready to do that. We got to be ready to preach the gospel at even a second moment's notice. And that's what I did that day. So this person, so I mean, now she's got it. She, now she, she's got a track. She heard me preach a little bit to her. She got a little cash from me. And by the way, she didn't ask me for money. I, when, when people out in the street ask me for money, I generally don't give it to them because I know what they're going to do with it. But she didn't ask me for money. She, asked, she actually asked me to carry some things for her. So... That's, there's a chance for it. That's an opportunity. So if uh, those things will come along, just pray for God to give you opportunities like that, and you will. Amen. And you, you just need to be ready. So I, like I said, I broke my own rule, and I wasn't ready. But from here on out, I'm going to resolve to be. So uh, let's, let's move on here. Next passage, Romans 1, 15 and 16. If anybody's got it, let me know if you want to read it. My voice is doing better than it was Friday. I got it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Yeah, I remember, I, I actually memorized those verses years ago. Um, it's true. That's, that's, the, that's really, that's it right there. That's, that's the it's very foundational right there. Paul was ready ready at a moment's or a second's notice to preach the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes. That's pretty self-explanatory. That's really what very foundational verse. Romans and John, very foundational past, very foundational books. Uh, and of course we talked about being instant in season. Okay, John, 1 John 4, 14, if I can if I'm reading my handwriting right. And then if we go, we've got a couple more verses, then I'm going to give you a couple suggestions on how to, how you doing, Mike? Good, how are you? Got a couple more verses. We'll give you a couple suggestions on just a way to preach the gospel quickly, like we've been doing out, in, like I've been doing out in the streets. Some. What passage is this? Was? Okay, First John. Four fourteen. Okay. And we'll, like I said, we'll read a couple more passages, and we'll give. I got a couple of suggestions on how to preach the gospel kind of quickly and, and, and effectively. Okay, First John four fourteen. Anybody got it? And we have seen to do te and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Yeah. And do test. The key there. I'm, I'm focusing on do testify. That's what we're here to do. 
Every Christian's job, you know, every Christian's job is to be a preacher, not a pastor per se, but a preacher. Every Christian needs to be a pre preacher, really a preacher and a teacher. Teaching is another thing we're going to talk about before the hour's over. Every Christian's job is to testify and to teach and to preach. Not everybody's called to be a pastor or an officer or a deacon or an elder or anything, but we are all called to be preachers. Men, women, you know, anybody, everybody, all, all that are saved, testify. It's a very important verse. Okay, a couple suggestions on how to preach the gospel here. And this is a little bit of a review from some other lessons we've had. These are all my notes. This book and this other book, are, these are all the notes I've taken on sermons over the last couple of years. Um, by the way, I suggest you do that. If, if, you, if you come, take notes at church because you, no one, nobody is going to remember everything. No one's going to remember all this stuff. Like, you know, I've worked for airlines. I've been a, I, I remember being in a pilot training class once, and it was two, two, like two weeks long. Nobody remembers all that stuff after two weeks. You go to school for two weeks, like eight to five every day. Then when the two weeks are up, nobody remembers. If you remember half of it, you're doing great. It's the same thing here. If you, you're not going to remember all the sermons, and I think if it's worth coming and hearing the preaching and hearing the teaching, it's worth writing down. So I'm, just, just an, I'm not trying to call anybody out, but it's just a, just a suggestion. Take notes at church. Make notes in your Bible. I guess pastor likes to make notes in his Bible. I don't really like to do that because I like to my Bible to look kind of neat. But it's a good idea. You know, it's a good idea. Just, just somehow, some way, make it so you remember what you learn. Okay. Here's a couple suggestions. And of course, this is not comprehensive. There's more than there's more ways to preach the gospel than just what I'm going to talk about here. But here's the first passage: John 3, 14 through 18. Gospel of John 3, 14 through 18. And this is the words of Christ. And what's the context of this? Anybody know offhand? Speaking of himself. Yeah, who was he speaking to? Do you know offhand? Oh, oh that's right. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Um, yeah, he was telling Nicodemus how to be born again, and it was kind of a it, to, to Nicodemus that was kind of a shocking statement, saying you need you need to be born again. You know, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Nicodemus probably had the whole Pentateuch memorized before he was 25 years old. He was a you know he was a very religious man. You would have viewed him as being a very decent, good man. Yet Jesus said to him, "You must be born again. All men must be born again." So we'll just read this real quick. If you need something real quick to, to share with somebody, here it is right here. I'll read it. I'll get it for you. Verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's, that's referring to that time when, when, when they were in the desert and they lifted up the brass and the serpent, and then they would just look and live, look at the serpent and live. And then, of course, some of the Israelites refused to do that. So that's really what the salvation is. It's as simple as looking and living. It's really Pretty that much. simple. Yeah. yeah. And now, of course, that's another topic to get into, but some, you know, some Christians aren't really cool with that. That's another topic for another day. Anyway, verse 15, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but ever let eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God that sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And I think this is the key verse here. He that believeth on him is not condemned, and he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the, only, in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Just memorize those four verses and just be ready to, sh to share them with people, like out on the street, like I did last Friday. I actually brought my Bible with me because I didn't have it memorized when I came back to that person. But still, it was, that's, that was my opportunity, and I'm glad, I was, I'm glad I got myself ready to take advantage of it. Okay, another gospel, good gospel passage. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6. Anybody want to do it? You are? Okay. You, have, you got anything? I got it. Uh, all right. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, uh, according to the scriptures. Uh, through six, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. And then he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part uh, remain unto this present, but uh, some are falling asleep. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good synopsis of the Gospel. And there's others too. I think there's a Romans road, which isn't really my favorite thing. I think the Romans road is a bit of a cut and paste job, but it does give you the scriptures that show salvation. I know some people like it. I, I think it's a good 
fucking pastor said that once. Probably just probably just because it's all in one book, you know, it's easy to find just a few for. Yeah, no, it's it's fine. I mean, I'm I'm for anything. I mean, it's, there's people that I mean, when I was first saved, I was um, I just one day I had a friend. When they were, we used to talk about this kind of stuff, and one day we were talking, and he, I said to him, I said, if God loves us, then why would he? If, if God loves us, why would he send his children to hell? And his reply was, now this guy's a Calvinist, so understand his reply here. He said, well, even though we're all God's children, no, this is what I said. I remember what I said now. He said, I said, if we're all God's children, then why would God send the, us to hell? And his reply was, yes, we are all God's children, but God will send some of his children to hell. Now, that's actually partly incorrect, because we're not, not all, the only people that are God's children are those that are believers. <laughs> So that's when I set out to read the whole scriptures. I said, well, I, I don't want to go to hell. I want to find out how I don't have to. So I started reading the whole scriptures. I, I set out to read the whole Bible then. I started in Genesis 1-1, and I read the whole Bible over the next several weeks and months. And then I, I got saved. I got saved when I was in a room all by myself. It was a Saturday night. I was in a room by myself. I got saved. I just got on my knees and asked God for mercy. Pretty good. It, was, it, was, it was in the month of May, 1986. And I don't remember the exact day, because I do remember that the hockey playoffs were on. That's how I remember it was in the month of May. <laughs> Don't ask me who was playing or who was winning. That's important. That I couldn't tell you. <laughs> but yeah, there's several script. Yeah, you know, any script. I think even the genealogies point to Christ. That Christ is a theme of the whole Bible. So there you have. It. There's a couple. There's a couple. Uh, just a couple passages that are good gospel. Just try to memorize it. To, uh, if you got time, memorize the two of those. And then you'll be able to just just preach it to people, just preach those four verses to people, and that's a good way to start a little sermon, a little impromptu sermon. Okay. Ready to preach the gospel. I think we've talked about it sufficiently. Um, let's see. i got to do this a little out of order here. I guess we'll talk about next. We'll talk about reproach. Be ready for reproach, and then we'll move into be ready for suffering. I mean, nobody really likes to suffer, but anyway, we'll get into it. We'll talk about reproach first. So, because uh, preaching the gospel often leads to reproach, as we'll talk, as we'll see from this verse here. Hebrews thirteen thirteen is our next verse. <clears throat> Twenty minutes, man. I didn't think I had that much material. Pretty amazing how quickly the time flies when you're up here. It's true. Yeah, it does. Doesn't it? Okay, Hebrews 13, 13, and we're going to expand on it a little bit too. And this has quite a bit to do with preaching the gospel, actually, when you, when you see what it says. Everybody hear me okay? Because. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, because the microphone's a little distracting for me, because hopefully... Okay, everyone's cool. Good. 13, okay, I'll, I got it. For all there, I'll get it. Hebrews 13, 13. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. <coughs> well, what does without the camp mean? Outside. Outside of where? Outside of the camp. He's referencing back to... Israel yeah. when they were in the wilderness. Yeah, the ancient so. encampment of Israel. What's outside? What's outside the camp mean to us? Mountains. Outside these walls. Well, outside these walls. Well, yeah. Uh, more specifically, outside really of the fellowship of the body of believers, because we could we could meet out in the middle of the we could meet out in the middle of a meadow in the open air and be and be and be church. Church is the people. Right. But no, I know what you meant though. Yeah, really outside these walls, outside, without the camp, out in the world. Really? And let's expand on this a little bit. Go to Leviticus. It's a book that I'm sure a lot of everybody reads all the time. Leviticus 14.3. <laughs> I was told once Leviticus is a dry, boring book. No. By a, by, a, by a person who was a little misguided, but he meant well. But uh, I think he's wrong. It's not dry. It's, it's not the easiest reading in the world, but it's, I wouldn't say it's dry. It's actually very interesting. It's actually very fascinating. Before we read this passage, what's I'm not just making any assumptions here. So, what what is Leviticus about? The whole book, what's it about? The law. What? The law. Well, the law, specifically the the Levites, right? The, the law, the the priestly duties and such things. Yeah. 
So, uh, okay, Leviticus 4, let's see 14 or 4, I said 14, we want 14, 3. Wait a minute, wait a minute. My notes might be wrong. No, they're right. Yeah, I really would have to revise this if I ever wanted to publish it. Right. Leviticus 14, 3. Anybody there? <laughs> Go ahead, Charlie. Nice uh, and loud. Okay, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look and behold if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. Okay, I'll read the rest here. Then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be that is to be cleansed, two buried alive and clean, and, and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And that goes on to describe the the process the the, 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 the process that the priest had to uh, had to administer there. Uh, well, anyway, going back to the verse here, we mentioned we had the priest goes forth out of the camp. So, who, who are the priests in the church age? Anybody in here a priest? Well, the answer is yeah, all of us are. All believers are a priest in the church age. A priest, with the definition of a priest, as I understand it, is anybody who can go directly to God, which is what we can do because of the finished work of Christ. Now, as, as the priest's duties were then, was to go forth out of the camp. To do what? Well, to speak, who is it speaking to here? Lep the, the, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. Now, he's talking, leprosy speaks of what? Sin. Sin, yeah. And, of course, is the type of, the leper does nothing. The priest seeks the leper, not the other way around. As we see, Luke, Luke 19.10 will tell you that as well, without... And uh, that's really what this is a picture of. It's a picture of the priest going out, the, the, the priest performing his priestly duties, going outside of the encampment of Israel to seek the leper. Whereas what our duty is is to go out without the to go outside of the encamp the encampment of our assembly and seek the lost. That's really what that's that's really what this is about. And the uh, verse Hebrews thirteen thirteen spoke of that as bearing the reproach of Christ out in the world. I think of, whenever I go soul winning, I think of that verse Hebrews thirteen thirteen, just bearing Christ's reproach. Someone might get mad, someone might curse at us, someone might slam the door, they might be mean to us. Well, but that's our job. We, that's part of our job is to bear the reproach of Christ. And of course the, the New Testament also speaks of uh, you should we should rejoice when, when somebody when we're I forgot the whole verse now, it's when we're put out of someone's company or spoken evil of for the name of Christ, we should, because great is our reward in heaven. I, I don't know the exact. I'm sorry, I don't have it memorized. But, but that's really what it's that's really what it's for. That's really what it's about. Be willing to be willing. Don't be afraid to be mocked by wicked men. You know, go out. Be will. That's part of what we're here for. It's, these are you know these are cross days. These are not crowning days. We're still in the we're not in the kingdom age yet. We're in the church age still. And Christ is Christ is really entreating the world to come to Him. You know through us. And that's really what we need to be ready for. Be ready for that. And we speak about, change subjects here a minute, we speak about being a, you know, God needs to, to, to in order to be used of God, you need to be a, a clean vessel, right? Well, I think part of being that clean vessel is being ready. If you're not ready, you can be clean and, be, and do all the things you're supposed to do, and if you're not ready, you're really not, you're not going to be used. You're going to be passed up. So being ready is part of the process. I think it's part of, I don't think I would separate the two things. So just be ready to suffer reproach if necessary. And I think if, if, if you're saved any length of time, you're going to suffer reproach at one time or another. You know? When I was first saved, I remember my mother saying, that I, I, I was in tears when she said this, too. This is years ago. She said, well, this sounds really far out and fanatical to me. That's what she does for her exact words to me. And I was, I, I was in tears over that then. And, of course, she, now she's come around a little more now. She, she wouldn't say that to me now. You know, she needs to get saved yet, too. She's 80 years old. She still needs to get saved. But... She's not be, she wouldn't be that she wouldn't say something that cynical now, but she did that at the time. And uh, that's just I know a man who was I, I, we had a, Philip, a missionary from the Philippines years ago come and speak to my church. His name was a brother Greenacre. He spoke about a man who got saved, and then he was a, he was a Catholic man in the Philippines. He got saved. Then I think uh, he got, what how's the story go? He got baptized. Actually, and his family was, they were all cool with it and everything, and then he got baptized. And then since his baptism, this had been like 20, at, the, at that point, this had been 20 years. 20 years since his baptism, his family still was not speaking to him because he had identified with Christ publicly through this baptism. So that's, you know, that's, that's part of the reproach. I know another example, uh, it was a girl, it was a woman, a young woman, 
my church in, in Wisconsin, Greendale Baptist, uh, I can't think of her name. I mean, Larry Peary, I think Larry Peary, those of you who know Larry, I think Larry Peary knows who this person is. I, I, I'd like to ask him and find out who she is. Her family was uh, Serbian Orthodox, and she, she got saved, started going to Greendale Baptist Church, my church. She got saved, and then uh, her dad kicked her out of the house because she got saved. And she came in and she got baptized and came and said, well, Dad, you know, you need, you need Christ. Well, he kicked her out of the house for that. And, she, and he hadn't spoke to his own daughter for 10 years or more at that point. But I think he came around eventually. He actually, since that time, he has spoken to her. So, you know, just hold, hold your ground. Don't, if somebody treats you like that, don't, A, don't treat him back like that, and B, just uh, trust God about it. Hold your ground, stand your ground. And, and just keep being nice about it, stand your ground. Keep praying, uh, keep, keep praying for that person. Yeah, exactly. Keep praying for that person. Don't, you know, don't respond in the flesh. I think I've said enough here about it. That's, uh, that's, yeah, that's part of the, that's part of the game. So we'll, 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 with that, we'll, we'll move into the concept here of being ready for suffering. You know, try, you know, the foundational, if you want to use that word, foundational verse for suffering. Philippians 1.29, that's a verse a lot of people have memorized. <coughs> But it's a sobering verse. It's a verse that's very important. Of course, I think all scripture is important, of course. It's Philippians 1.29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Yeah, that's exact. That's it right there. So just be armed with that mindset that sometimes suffering and persecution are part of what we're going to receive. Just, I think just be resigned to it. Just accept it. That's part of what we have to deal with. This isn't, you know, Christ has not come back for the second time yet. So we still have to, we still have to be patient. We still have to represent him. We still have to do what we need to do and, and have this mindset. Be saying yes. Just submit to God about it. Say yes, you know, Lord. It is not just given unto me to believe, but also to suffer. Okay, one more verse about it. First Peter two nineteen. We got a couple more verses about it actually. First Peter two nineteen. I'll, I'll get it. Nobody's there. Uh, for this is thankworthy of a man for conscience toward God, endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Go ahead and read twenty two while you're there, if you will, Sean. Uh, for what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, uh, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. And then I'll read 21 here, and then really, really I probably should have listed all three of the verses here, but verse 21 then says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. So uh, if, you, you, if you're buffeted for something, you, like let's say you committed a crime and you got arrested. Then you say, you know, you're right. I, uh, that's what happened with Jeffrey Dahmer. He, uh, he, he, he got arrested finally after he got caught and found out what he was doing, and then he got he finally he admitted to the whole thing, and he said he, he admitted he was wrong. He got saved while he was in jail, and then somebody attacked him and killed him. Uh, but that's he was suffering for his own faults there. But uh, God actually seems to put a high premium on if you suffer, I think specifically as a Christian, and you take it patiently. I mean, God really, God's really, God's pleased with that very much so. And I think that's what we should strive to have. That's what we should strive for. And I think the next, the next passage we're going to read here is in Revelation. I think it's giving you better instruction and probably the best instruction you can get on suffering that I can think of here. Revelation 2, starting at verse 9. And, if, and ending at verse 11, if anybody wants to volunteer. It's 10.30 already. Wow. You want to? Sure. Okay, I guess ma'am. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. 9 through what? No, 10 and 11 if you would. Okay. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and ye may be tried, 
and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of second death. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Without looking, who knows what church that was written to? Smyrna. Yeah, right. So where, where is Smyrna, by the way? Anybody know? Turkey. Where? Turkey. Well, modern day Turkey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, it's on the the name of the modern day name of it is, is I wrote it down. I can't pronounce it very well. Ishtar. Is is here? Is here or something? It was actually still called Smyrna up until about 1930, and it was still it was still called Smyrna when you had the, the Ottoman Empire was was ruling that land, and then the Ottoman Empire. Actually, I'll add with the Central Powers in World War One, and they lost the war. And then after that, they were dissolved, and that's when several several nations got their independence. Like Turkey was one of them. And then a few years later, they actually changed the name of Smyrna. It was actually called Smyrna for many, many centuries. Um, let's go back here. Let's um, take a look at this. Verse nine, the very first phrase says, "I know thy works." You know, that's actually very important. That's actually me very meaningful. Christ is telling them that he knows his works. You know, maybe, I don't know what you've gone through in life. I don't know what you think you may have given up, or I don't know what you think you may have to suffer or endure for Christ. But you know what? If, or, or what you may have done, what, what kind of labor you may have done, you feel like, let's, let's, let's be real here. We feel unappreciated about it sometimes. Um, but Christ knows your works. He knows what everyone's doing. He, he, knows, he knows what you've given. Maybe he knows what you've given up or given or what you've labored or wrought. He knows all this. And it means something to him. And that's, that, to me, that means an awful lot here. And here's an example of it here. We're going to go for another scriptural example of that very thing. Hold your place in Revelation here. Go to Luke 11.50. Well, no, wait. Before you go to Luke, go to... Well, yeah, that's fine. Luke 11.51. This is an example of God remembering somebody's works. <coughs> Say again? I have it. Okay, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, uh, verily I say unto you, it shall be required in this generation. And this is the passage when Jesus was announcing all the woes upon the lawyers and upon the Pharisees, and when they were asking previously, they had asked a sign from heaven, and he had said he's going to give them a, the only sign that generation was going to get was the sign of Jonah. But carefully look at this here. It says, for the blood of Abel. Now turn to Genesis 4, 8. It's nice to be Bible to have all these fingerprints on right? Genesis 4, 8. Abel, okay. I got it here. Let me know when you're there. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Yeah, and here, this is, that took place in, according to Dr. Schofield's infinite wisdom, that took place in B.C. 3875, somewhere around there. I don't know exactly. I, I have a book that actually has the, the dates on it. I, I forgot to read my book, though. But it's somewhere around that time. So that's 38, 3900 years before Christ, and here Christ is saying in, in Luke uh, 5, 1151, that was when he was walking the earth. That was approximately the year A.D. 30. That's a good, almost 4,000 years later, he's remembering the works of Abel, who was slain. Why? Why did Cain kill him? Anybody know? Jealous. Say again, sir. He was jealous. Yeah, envy. Yeah. Because his own Bible, because Abel's works were righteous and his own, were un, his own works were unrighteous. Cain knew what he was supposed to do. He knew what kind of sacrifice was to take place. He knew all that. God even gave him a chance to, get, to do it again, and he refused. And here, this is this many centuries later, God is still remembering the works of this man. He's actually referred to as being one of the prophets here, Abel to Zechariah. So that's, it. That's, how God remem so that's how God remembers your works. That's how much it is to worth it to serve God. That's how much it's worth it to serve God and to live for God. Because he's going to remember everything, and he's going to reward you for it, frankly, a lot more than we deserve. Yeah. He's going to reward us for the little bit we're doing for him, frankly. I, I mean, none of us can really say we've done much for Jesus. But let's get honest about that. We haven't done anything close to what we should be. But we can resolve to, we, but we can and should, I think, resolve to, to, to do more. 
to do better and to, to be more faithful. Just to be, just to be faithful. Just to be what we should be. And that's really what I wanted to get across today. Just, just to be faithful and be ready to be what you should be. That's really what the whole point of this teaching is today. So going back to Revelation here. Of course, in today, in today's world, we have fake news. In the time of Smyrna, they had, I guess, fake Jews. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. So they were fake. They weren't really Jews. They were a bunch of fakes. It was a synagogue of Satan. I mean, I actually was looking up a little bit about Smyrna. I was trying to find some old photographs. I saw some old... I, I don't have a computer. I couldn't post them on the wall here. But there were some photographs of some of the old ruins of some of the, of the ancient city. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what was going on there. I'm not sure what this, this synagogue was all about. But... Uh, he goes on to say, because of what was going on, that some of the Smyrna believers were going to suffer probably pretty badly. But he says, but here's what God says here. Fear none of these things which shall itself suffer. Don't be afraid of it. And we really shouldn't be today either. Don't be afraid of any, any suffering. Don't be afraid of suffering. Don't be afraid of any of this. Don't be afraid of reproach. Don't be afraid of any of that stuff. Yeah. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into, the pri into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Some misguided person once said that this is showing that the church will go through the tribulation. But that's not the case here, because this is just saying, this is ten days here. That's not, you know, the word tribulation can just mean hardship. This is not talking about the tribulation. This is talking about just a, a tribulation mm -hmm. that, these, that these believers would go through. Ten days? Is ten days metaphorical here? I don't know. It might have been ten literal days. I don't know exactly. Uh, but listen to what he says. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. I think that's the best, the best instruction I can really give anybody on just have, being ready to suffer. Suffering, reproach, suffering, whatever might come your way. Don't fear what men can do to you. Don't fear, don't fear them that can only destroy the body, but fear, fear him that can destroy both the body and soul in hell. <coughs> your, both your body and your soul get destroyed in hell. Hell is a real, literal place. Pastor preached on it maybe a couple months ago. Said it is. It is literally people going to be their their actual bodies are actually going to be thrown down there, and it will be destroyed. So this is a very real thing. Um, so I guess that's pretty much. Any questions? Anybody want to add anything? This is supposed to be an open forum. Remember, <laughs> this is sort of like Paul talking to the Athenians, right? <laughs> So, uh, I th I th but I think this is good. I think this is good teaching for us. I think this is good. Um, of course, uh, we don't, well, I don't want to get into all the, whether the, the, what the letters, if some people said that these letters in, of Revelation were actually metaphorical periods outlining the church age. I don't really think that that's the case. But anyway, that's another topic for another lesson. Um, okay, well, let's move on to the next thing we're supposed to be ready for. So now we're supposed to be ready to preach the gospel. We're supposed to be ready to take reproach. We're supposed to be ready to suffer. What's another thing we should be ready for? Well, how about to teach? You know, teaching and preaching are not just for the same two or three people in any given church. It's supposed to be for every believer. Everybody should get a turn at this. I'm serious. Everybody should get a turn up here. It shouldn't just, it shouldn't just be the same two or three people. Now, I, I get it. You shouldn't have someone who's maybe a new Christian, someone who doesn't really know the Bible well enough to teach it, but I think everyone should strive to get to where you do know the Bible well enough to teach it. Because that, that's actually a very high level of mastery. You know, I'm a pilot. One of the best things you can do if you want to be a pilot is become an instructor. I didn't want to become an instructor. I remember when I was thinking about that career, I was like, nah, I don't want to become an instructor. That's a rubbish job. You're going to get paid lousy. You know, all these things that are wrong with it. But it actually makes you, it made me so much better at my job just by learning to be able to teach other people. Same thing here. You learn how to teach the scriptures and you learn how to teach someone else to live for God. It makes you so much better at living for God yourself. Titus 2, 3, and 4. We're almost out of time, but that's all right. We've got a little bit. A couple more verses, we'll, and I'll relinquish the pulpit. Where's Titus? Okay, Titus, yeah. There's five T's in a row. Thessalonians, Timothy, Timothy, and Titus. Titus 2, 3, and 4. Anybody ready? Uh, the aged women, likewise, that they gain behavior as becometh holiness, not Paul's accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, 
uh, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Yeah, the, uh, the aged women, the older, I guess the older ladies are supposed to teach. Well, it says here, teachers are good things, and also, but verse 4 says, they may teach the younger women to be sober and to love their husbands and children. That's something that, that's a teaching you're supposed to have in the church, is the older, the older ladies are supposed to teach the younger ladies how to love their husbands and children. It's interesting. Uh, Hebrews 5.12. This is more of, now this is kind of, this one's really, hits home. Hebrews 5.12. Uh, for one, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as of need of milk, and not of strong meat. Yeah, so that that's right there. You should strive to be able to become, you should strive to have a level of mastery of the scriptures and of, of living for God to where you can teach someone else how to do it. Hopefully by, yeah, by, by instruction, yeah, but also by example. And that's really what, and in some cases, sometimes you have some believers that, well, we don't all progress at the same rate, do we? No. I was one of these cats who didn't get baptized. I, I didn't get baptized for four years, which is ridiculous, but that's what I did then. Partly because I didn't know better. I, I, I remember talking to a friend about it, and he kind of gives me a, some of these Bill Clinton type answers about it. And, uh, <laughs> so I finally, I finally, but finally, I started going to a Baptist church, and I didn't need to say that, sorry. I finally go to a Baptist church, and I got convicted about it. I said, you know, I, I've been saved all this time, and I have never been baptized. And uh, so I finally did it. It's four years later. So I was one of these people that really. So I found it. I found it to be true that if you don't get baptized fairly quickly after you, if you get saved and you get, you need to get baptized, you know, reasonably quickly. And if you don't, it's going to be a long time. And that's what happened with me. So, but God was patient with me, even though there's other things I should have been doing and wasn't doing. But God was patient with me, and He's kept, and He's kept me this many years. You know, I told you earlier I got saved in 1986, and he's, I'm still here. God's still been faithful with me all this time. And. Uh, but uh, maybe, but but this verse says that we ought to, for, over in a reasonable amount of time, we ought to be teachers. We ought to be able to teach the word of God, and that's something we should strive to do. So maybe if you're not able and ready to teach, you know, get yourself ready. Start studying harder. Start learning this to where you can teach it, and start learning how to start learning how to teach it, and start learning it, and start learning how to organize it, and and just present it to people. And so hopefully, hopefully, I helped. You know, we're out of time here. Hopefully I helped as much as I can. I know I'm kind of an amateur. I'm not Pastor Price. I'm not as good as Charlie or any of these guys, but hopefully I helped you as much as I could here. Hopefully you got something out of it. I appreciate your attention. And I thank you very much for allowing me to teach your Sunday school this morning. And I uh, guess any questions? If, if not, I'll just let us pray and dismiss. Anyone? Yeah. All right. Let's pray and dismiss here. Dear God, thanks for giving us a good Sunday school hour and help us to take to heart what we what we spoke about. Help us to be ready to preach. I, I spoke gospel first because I think the first and foremost thing I want us to be ready for is to preach the gospel. And help us to do that. Help us to go out our ways this weekend to preach the gospel and be ready to do what we spoke about today. And give us a good uh, give us a good service the rest of the day and here and also in Miami. Give the prices a good refreshing time as they're away and uh, bring them back safely to us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.